Welcome back, everybody. Scott uh, back with us. And our guest today in the record player is the one and only Alfie Zappacosta, who, of course, had a string of hits uh, in Canada over the last 40 years plus, uh, as well as being an accomplished songwriter and, of course, uh, still out on the road playing and performing, um, including upcoming uh, an upcoming benefit show in Vancouver, which we will talk about uh, today uh, as well. Welcome to TRP, Alfie. Thank you so much. Thanks, for Scott. Here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we spoke last week when you were out in the Maritimes, uh, so I know um, you've been traveling around. Um, I appreciate you being with us and taking the time. How's the East Coast doing? What were you doing out there? Um, about um, seven or eight dates that I just put together really from, uh, oh, from, uh, well, I started off in Toronto. Toronto doing the thing at the Hughes Room. Certainly Hughes Room has been a uh, a mainstay for me for a lot, a lot of years. <clears throat> Watch them go through, come up the ranks and sort of uh, run into all sorts of hardships and shit, but they, uh, they're doing fine. They, 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 they do go to different bars, uh, different uh uh, outfitters and they just get them to uh, what well, they did the Alma combo the one time yeah. where uh, and I was found that really confusing but I finally figured <laughs> out that they were using it to host Hughes room live at the Alma combo and then they did 3030 um, Dundas Street West where I was there and it, it's working out for them until they get like a, a permanent location so anything that I could do to help them out and and, and well they, they help out a lot of musicians as well I mean it seems it goes hand in hand but I was there doing that, and that was fun, playing with the full band, and then went out to, uh, oh, let's see, where did I go? I went to St. John, uh, I went to uh, uh, PEI, I went to Bridgetown, I went to Petite Riviere, I went to Fredericton, I did just a bunch of dates and just, uh, you know, checking it out. They're still like, you know, if, geez, if they're not overcoming storms and, and Fiona <laughs> and all these te things, stuff like that, they're getting trying to get through... Uh, the whole crap of COVID and sort of it caused all the trouble it, it has for the last few years. So there's still still a lot of, I've been noticing there's still a lot of reluctancy as far as people in coming out and still a certain amount of fear. I suppose it might have something to do with um, the folks that are my fans and people that listen to me. I've been listening for a lot of years and they're getting on in years too. So you try to keep an open mind, but understanding that it's not as easy for people to get around that much anymore. So. Uh, I'm trying to sort of like lighten and get a lot of a, a younger crowd, like at least 55 or something like that. To be able to <laughs> I was going to say, aren't we all getting uh, getting on? Um, yeah. I want to hit on a few things in the short time we've got, but uh, I'll start where it started with this, because this is this has been in my collection since I was like 10 years old. And mm -hmm. it is something that I listen to all the time. Um, it, it, gets put <laughs> on, it gets put on my record player constantly. Um, I think... Uh, that's where it all began for you was surrender. Um, tell, talk to me a little bit about the beginnings and 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 how it all got going. Um, surrender was um, friends. You know, we uh, we started. Uh, uh, everybody was doing some playing with different bands and whatnot. And we were kids, and I think uh, I think I think first uh, the first most important thing is like you know like anything having some fun meeting girls and things and uh, <laughs> you know uh, started doing it and. Um, uh, seemed to be people seemed to like it, you know. Uh, Surrender, where really uh, we were in different bands called Second Wind, and then there was another band we we joined up with a lady called Jeanette Brantley, uh, myself and Paul Delaney, the drummer, and Peter Curry uh, was keyboard player, and we worked with Jeanette Brantley for a while, and then we were going and doing all the Timmins and all those things, just having kind of fun. But I realized that we're just doing like disco music and whatnot, and I thought this is if you know if going to stay in this thing it was fun for a while because we we're kids having fun but it wasn't going to go anywhere so i said if we're going to do anything we should be writing original music so, so we went into uh, the little store a little shop that was a music store ken jones music and uh we teach paul and i paul to teach drums and i would teach um guitar to preteens you know just the young kids and then we'd be able to use the uh the studio studio the store at night to be able to practice so we did, and what what got lucky was um, Paul Delaney had met a fellow called Ken Morris, whose uh, brother-in-law was Frank Davies, and Frank Davies was a publisher in town and uh, mm -hmm. big name at the time. He was working with uh, uh, with Capitol Records. He with Capitol Records it wasn't even well EMI, but it was Capitol Records. It was Capitol back and, then. And anyway, we got a demo together, and we were doing. We gave it to to Ken, who gave it to Frank, and all of a sudden we ended up getting a deal with Capitol Records. And so all of a sudden away we went. 
and Surrender was a happening little unit for a while. I was never supposed to be the singer and main songwriter. And so it took me many, many, many years to get over that. Well, but, correct me if I'm wrong, but Surrender, I mean, Surrender didn't necessarily break up. You guys just kind of morphed into Zappa Costa, right? Well, I, of course, and it was never, none, none of that was my idea. Uh, you know, I, they, we, we were looking for, when Surrender, we went into the studio to do these songs, the demos, to look at doing the, the demos for the record with Harry, Terry Brown, in the Rush fame. We went into the studio and the whole idea was I was just going to put my vocals down because the show, uh, we were going to start auditioning singers and front people. And uh, because I knew the songs, I was writing most of the song, most of them anyway. So I was writing them and, and they, the people that would come in and um, we were going to get people to come in and sing and see who we liked as a singer. And so I sang the damn demos and then that was the end of it. And they said, you're the singer. And I, I argued it for a long time. It morphed into Zappa Costa because the record company and the publishers realized that I was doing a lot of the writing and I was, the, the I, I guess, the, the guy. Zappa Costa seemed cool. They sort of pushed that whole thing up on me. It was never my decision. But morphing is a good way to put it, but it was definitely pushed that way based on publishers and record company people made me the man. And you took, um, I mean, Start Again and It's All Been Done Before went on the first Zappa Costa record as well. And yep. uh, I mean, those are truly the best Canadian songs uh, ever, as far as I'm concerned. Phenomenal Thank stuff. You. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the first few Zappa Costa albums did incredibly well. Um, I've got such great memories of, you know, watching uh, music video shows and, and Good Rockin' Tonight and seeing the video for uh, Nothing Can Stand In Your Way. Um, how did you... Did you enjoy that part of it? I mean, were you okay with that part of the, the music videos and the, the media and the interviews and the, all that stuff? There was, um, for a while there, it seemed like it got a lot bigger than I, uh, you know, there was a, a great big moving bus, so to speak, that uh, I had nothing to do with, not, you know, there was a, uh, it was definitely started in the move, like, you know, a, a mini juggernaut, or so, you know, a juggernaut of some sort, but I, it, I didn't mind when it got to a point, like, for example, I, I realized that the, the, a lot of times that you think that their experience of record companies and management and all these people and stuff like that would know what they were talking about. They definitely used the pretty boy um, a schmaltzy thing to do things like we should be lovers where like I'm wrestling half naked women in jello. <laughs> And um, <laughs> so, so, you know, th there was things that I thought were really pretty stupid. And uh, and at the same time, it was definitely not a caricature that I was b going to inherit because I didn't want anything to do with it. That that that, that kind of crap wasn't. When we did When I Fall in Love Again, uh, when I fall in love, Don Allen getting involved in some of the recordings of the doing the videos and stuff like that, it, was, it, it became classier. When we were doing the live stuff with Nothing Can Stand In Your Way, Don Allen was involved in those things. Those were times where I thought it was definitely going more in a direction that I thought I could be comfortable with. But it didn't take long because we were doing the kind of music we were doing really didn't fit the FM and what they were selling, what they were going after. Mm -hmm. So we kept falling between, you know, putting, you know, we kept falling in the cracks. Um, round about that same time you did, uh, you were invited to do Tears Are Not Enough, which of course uh, was Canada's answer to Do They Know It's Christmas, We Are the World, yeah. uh, from the States and UK. Um, what was it like walking into that room? I, I, I spoke to Jane Sibri, I asked her the same question, and she said that it was just surreal, just walking into a room with, with Joni Mitchell and Neil Young and, and people like that. Um, it was, for me, it was, it was I, I thought everybody played it very low key. We were told not to not to go. God, not we were told. Not we listened because we were told. It was just a, just a, as far as the way I felt about it. And just walking in there, I just knew that there was a, some some very important people in the music and and what they had done and whatnot. But I was not mesmerized by it at all. I, I thought that it was a very special thing that was going on. I, I treated it with the respect that I thought it was due, and uh, I didn't run around asking people like you know give me your. Uh, give me your, uh, uh, sign this for me, you give me some autographs, stuff like that. No, I, I thought it was a wonderful thing they were doing. Uh, it was an interesting place to, to be able to be, but nobody was doing any kind of a show offy kind of thing, even though like Bruce Allen and, the, and Lou Blair at the time, I was with Lou Blair and um, uh, the people that were the organizers for all this thing was leave your egos at the door. I never really had a problem with that kind of stuff. So nobody was walking around thinking that they were big shit or anything like that. So it was, <laughs> it, it was great. And 
and I'd forgotten to tell you the truth that I was playing pinball with Joni Mitchell. I had a real nice chat <laughs> with her and stuff, but we were playing pinball and just minding our own business and stuff. And um, the rest of the people were pretty much busy doing what they needed to do. Ronnie Hawkins was a laugh. Lisa Del Bello. There was so many people like Veronique Bellavo. There was, as I said, there was an awful lot of people that weren't all, uh, you know, uh, that like, you know, it was, it was a fun day. It was a fun day. Uh, Lisa, one of my favorites, Lisa Del Bello, and you got to sing your line with her. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. I always found it funny that you were Alfie Zappacosta going by Zappacosta. She was Lisa Del Bello, and by that point, she was going by just Del Bello. So Del Bello. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. I know, well, you know, at one time that when they were saying too, one would just uh, really quickly. There was a fellow that uh, when when he heard my name was Alfie Zapp Alfredo Zappacosta. He said, you know, based on the, th the fact that there was a lot of Italians that had come in, like, you know, uh, in the beginning, he says, you might probably do a lot better in this industry if you call yourself Al, Al Costa. Because, <laughs> you know, a lot of people with this Alfredo Zappacosta might not really, you know, tend to, like, I just basically told him to hit it, you know, like anything. <laughs> um, I don't know if you know this, but uh, 35 years, exactly 35 years ago today, Dirty Dancing was the number one <laughs> Uh, album on the U.S. Uh, Billboard charts. Um, Overload, the song you did, uh, how did that situation come about? How did you get involved with the Dirty Dancing? It was all uh, based on, uh, well, a Jimmy Einer, number one, was uh, very instrumental. And Jimmy Einer had been working with Frank Davies for a long time. They, they'd done a lot of work together. They were, you know, Frank was a publisher and Jimmy was all that and then some. And so, um, he had a company called Millennium Records, and at one point, um, uh, EMI Capital were were dumping me. Like probably let me go three, two or three times, and they kept hiring me back. I, it was a, a crazy love affair, hate thing that we did. You know, I loved Dean Cameron. You know, I, I, Dean Cameron was a, was a wonderful character, uh, but um, it was business after all. So um, Jimmy Einer at one point asked me if I would be interested in going to Millennium Records in New York. Um, with, uh, I was not ready to go to New York and then start getting on tour and just, I felt like, you know, I, I wasn't ready. My kids were teeny. Uh, my wife wasn't really well and I had to, I had to see what was uh, the priorities, but Jimmy, so I, I turned down Millennium Records going to the States and start doing some, who knows what could have happened, but it, that's nothing I really dwell on. But anyway, Jimmy <laughs> said one day. One day, Alf, I'm going to give you a call. I'm going to ask you to do something for me. And you make sure you do that. It's the one thing. And I went, sure, Jimmy. So he asked me to write a song. And I, with a, and I, and a, Marco, at the time, we were at the beginning of a lot of things where people started to have these home studios, you know, like, you know, in the garages and whatnot. And so we just did a demo went with Mark and got Marco Luciani involved in it. Uh, Jerry and, and Gerald O'Brien and Jerry Mosby were busy at the time. So for Marco, was a set of hands that we were able to use. Went into the went into the garage, did a quick demo, and sent it off to, to Jimmy. And he said the, he said that the producers liked it. Now I had no idea about this film or where it was going. I just I said to Jimmy that when he said to do do a song for me when I ask you. And I said, sure. So I did. So I sent it off to him, and he said the the producers like it. So we came up to Wellesley Sound Studio, and he came up with it, and we recorded the record. And then I did you know that you, did you know that you were going to be singing it, or did you just think you were writing the song? Well, uh, I you know I, I I never really thought about that. It's a good question, actually. I just uh, I at that point in time I really didn't care. I was just I, I told Jimmy that I would, and I did. And I wrote the song, sang it, and he said the publisher, the the, the producers liked it just the way it was. Uh, we figured out a few little things, brought it like I said, brought it into uh, Wellesley Sound Studios, and handed it over. And that's it. Now, back then, too, there was no Vestron. Who's Vestron? Uh, they were using a lot of the instant, a lot of the people that were involved were sort of like the kind of at the end of their career, if you can imagine. You know, a lot of the people were sort of like not in the uh, hierarchy of what was going on at the time. So, uh, uh, and then what can I tell you? The, the, everybody started saying this, this movie is going gangbusters. Mm -hmm. And one thing led to another, and uh, and and there it was, dirty dancing. History was made. It's a part of pop culture. I mean, I can just imagine what the amount of that of uh, just having a song on that soundtrack probably. I mean, 
Second. It was well. There was a, it was definitely took took me off the road and I got a I got a cockroach. Of, you know, the things about like when you with your record company stuff. Like when we were doing the working and stuff, there's you know unless you start selling millions of records and things right. are doing really well, unless you go on tour forever, you don't start seeing any money until a lot lot later down the line. So it wasn't anything that was coming right away. Um, so my idea of writing for a living and doing theater all under the the umbrella of the arts. I was doing a lot of different things. So, uh, but yeah, it uh, it got us out of cockroach infested apartments, and the, 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 we start to realize how income tax really works <laughs> on people. And we, I was very careful with it. It didn't become like anything phenomenal, but more more money than sort of we've been used to, like growing up and, and stuff like that. But we just for me, it was fine. I got out of Dodge and moved out of Toronto. Um, I've always wanted to ask because this, I mean, you, you hear it on the radio, you hear it on probably, I don't know, TV, but I, I know on the radio, you can't turn on the radio in Toronto without hearing the Pizza Nova commercial, yeah. um, which I, I mean, every day for what, 35 years, whatever it is now, um, who, were you writing jingles and commercials and stuff like that at the same time that you were doing records or was that yep. something that was that a favor for someone what where did that come from no i was it was just a, a way of being able to again under this umbrella of the arts it was a anything that i could do for me from writing from doing and singing commercials and doing whatever you know paid for diapers and and paid for things that, that like i said at the time i really had no i had, didn't have any idea that i wanted i didn't want to be like a rock star I didn't I didn't like that I never I you know there was there was definitely people my, you know much of their chagrin that I didn't have that kind of really mentality because it was I didn't it wasn't believable to me and it was just a, a falsehood it was craziness and the people around you would not I didn't like that idea much but um but the pizza commercial that again I it was something that they it was a, based on a song called Feniculi Fenicula. <laughs> which is a, a huge Italian, like an old uh, uh, folk folk tune, you know, finiculi, finicula, da, 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 finiculi, finicula. And then they asked me to do it, and of course, and then um, they went on to uh, went on to do that thing, and then they they had it running because I was doing it was with actor, and I was doing the commercial. Then they 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 did the commercial, and played for a long time, and I saw payment for it, like we normally see, like every i don't know six weeks or something every yeah. every 18, 18 weeks i can't remember they you get a payment but they went ahead and uh put another one out say when the moon hits your eye big pizza pie pizza nova so it wasn't doing very well so they put they took it but bought it back out and then they tried to pull a fast one and they did they said that they bought it outright so they didn't have to pay us anymore so really that was nasty so um they were looking at redoing it because now they had to change the number for Kitchener and some other areas and stuff like that. So they, I have to say the pizza Nova came through, you know, in, in the long run, they came through and they were, they were great about it because, uh, and, and I thank them because they, uh, they made up for lost time. The fact that they said they bought it, they did it. They, it could have been sort of like a little bit, maybe illegal, but it doesn't <laughs> matter because they, uh, whatever they did, they made up for it. In, in paying me back in royalties and whatnot, what they had to do so they could sing it as much as they want. As far as people liking that that song, I mean, I can't stop them. I mean, Barry Manilow did it with Coke, you know? I mean, uh, it doesn't it doesn't matter to me. I, I Maybe I'd appreciate it every now and then when I come to Toronto, they give me a free pizza. I was gonna say, did you get free pizza for life or something? I mean, geez, there's not a single person that doesn't know that song, that doesn't know that song. They gave me shit, but uh, everybody, uh, everybody liked the, uh, the everybody liked that finiculi finicula. Well, they oh, did. Oh, oh, yeah, they did for sure. Um, well, they're getting old and they're all disappearing, so you know, I don't know how much longer they're gonna go. <laughs> I have, I have a feeling that that commercial will be around when we're all dead. To be perfectly honest, um, <laughs> to, uh, I want to quick, very quickly. We've only got a minute left. Um, the uh, the show um, at uh, in Vancouver, which is coming up, I believe it is. November 25th um, yeah. for the Paul Sugar uh, Palliative Care Foundation. How did yeah. you get involved in that? Um, is, is that uh, the uh, Eagles? There's a bunch of guys that gotten together, the Eagles Foundation, and they've done uh, um, uh, they've done a bunch of stuff before, like in, in raising monies for certain things. It's a group of guys that got together and they do all these wonderful things for folks. And uh, I did it uh, 
a year prior or was it a couple of years now it's hard to probably a couple of years because COVID came by so um um yeah so so we did it then and uh, it, uh i would give it a call again to see if i wanted to come by and do some more stuff and and i said absolutely i mean i was going out that way anyhow uh, i'm going out to do some stuff out in victoria and nanaimo and we I just keep going back and forth as much as I can, just Canada, and and performing. If I can get like four or five months out of the year by just my actual performing, then I love it. The fact that I'm going out to, to do this thing, I'm, I'm looking forward to it as I usually do. And I'll remember all the faces and uh, realize that what we're doing it for, uh, you know, we'll, we'll meet the people that uh, uh, are, are going to be graced by whatever the foundation and much money they raise for them and whatnot so it's, it's 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 a great benefit and a great cause um tickets are still available for the show at eventbrite.ca um that's eventbrite.ca um to help the great cause uh, yeah they've and, opened it up that they've opened it up to the public as well so i imagine mm -hmm. so please come on down i thought it was going to be just you know basic to their foundation and whatnot but they've opened it up for anybody who's interested so please do come that's fantastic. I can't thank you enough for being with us. Um, uh, I'm glad you took the time. Uh, um, best of luck at the show. Best of luck the rest of the year. Uh, have a good holiday. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Merry, merry, happy, happy for sure. All right. Thanks a lot, Alfie. Okay. Thank you very much.